all, ask him, and uh, put him on the spot. I'd like to hear some of the comments he has to make. He did a real good job on the first meeting, and uh, we as NFO members and staff can learn a lot from these people. Because today, we've got to have some changes. We have to grow up a little bit. I don't make quite as much a noise about it as Bill does, but the member today, the farmer today, I'm going to say the farmer today has a chip on his shoulder about the packer. He's a no good SOB. He's out to steal my cattle. Sure he is, if you're going to let him do it. I don't blame him, I'd do it too. And he'll tell you the reasons why. We are going to have to build a farmer-packer relationship. We're going to have to tolerate each other. It's somewhat like being married. You know, after a while you just kind of learn to tolerate each other. Because we can't get along without them, and they can't get along without us. So let's don't forget that. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Clifton. That's probably a different type of introduction he's ever had, but I'd like to be different. Doc? Thank you. He's pretty kind. He didn't tell you that the, the, the previous crop got me so excited I just picked up the table and threw it at him. Uh, of course, I'm a little late getting in here. Uh, I had an opportunity, you know, to take advantage of what we were always getting accused of. I ran down to the hog meeting and asked the guy from Wilson what he's telling them so we wouldn't be telling the audience different stories. So I had a little chance for us to get together, so first us practice to get together and decide what we're going to do. But uh, I, I think that uh, being a little more serious, that uh, there is some conflicts that have gone on over a long period of years that really aren't justified. Human nature is human nature, I guess. Each one of us is imbued with a philosophy of if things go right, I did it. If things go wrong, the other fellow did it. And uh, generally, when you're mad at somebody, you if you stop and think, and 99% of the time you won't or you wouldn't be mad, you're not really mad at the other person you're mad at yourself for not being able to handle the situation. And most of the time when we are really angry about the, the prices we're getting, or what's happening to us is we're not mad at the guy that didn't pay us a higher price, we're mad at ourselves for letting him take advantage of us. And at the current price, I can't think maybe the NFO has got a point in that uh, maybe we ought to be kind of mad at ourselves a little bit, and not so mad at other people. I, I think too that uh, too often we are inclined to discuss or think about other people's problems within our own reference or framework without any real thought as to what's involved in the total operation. I, I think very few farmers have any concept of uh, or cattle feeders of uh, what really goes on in, in, in the distribution channel. Let me just give you, for, for instance, the kinds of things that happen to you on our side of the fence. We go out and uh, we uh, set up our operations for next week and not happen to run uh, three or four various operations in the company. We want to buy cows out in Postville, and we need those cows to be uh, Holsteins, 1050 to 1100, 95% canners and cutters. Now the reason we need that, we already know from, that, that, that we're going to run those into Chicago to Baltimore. I want to rob the insides, the outsides, the knuckles, the rounds, and the roll strips and about half of the shoulder glides. And then the rest of it is going to, going to give me enough chunk meat that I can send it into Livonia and Philadelphia and make wieners out of it. So this is all set up, and I, I know how many briskets I'm going to have to pump in Chicago for corned beef and so forth and so on. And I've got it all set up for the week, and Ernie Mars out of Postville has got me a load of cows coming every day. And this is great. Friday I've got all done, and Monday I come in across my legs, and the first thing that happens is he phones up and says, Say, I just found out those cows aren't going to show up today. So now, now the wheels start to spin. 
I got all kinds of alternatives, you know. I could cut, cut the game back in Chicago. I could go out in the open market and buy the various cuts that I made for my processing and the cow meat that I made for the plants to make the wieners. Or I could go out and find somebody who just happened to have a load of cows and couldn't sell last week and could ship the cows in at the right time. So you plug all this into your, into your computer system the best you can. You put an answer right quick. And you check all the brokers and see who's got what for sale. Decide what you're going to do. And you get that all set up, and just about the time you get it set up, uh, Ernie get, gets the phone and he says, Oh, all these cows just showed up, he found them. So that's great. So I go through the young, young scramblers old mess, and you get going back, and so far all you've done, you know, is have a little fun and run the figures around the chart and get a few plugs on the computer. And uh, you, you cross your legs, and about that time, he says, We've got those, kills, those cows killed, but it looks like about 40% of them are burning utilities. And I've got absolutely no use for bombing utilities. Those were scheduled next week, because next week I'm going to bomb the bombing utilities out, and uh, that's going to go into the government contracts. But I really don't, really don't think I want those cows hanging out there, because we need one of ways to get around the point to make to them a government contract. Furthermore, I, I can't burn them out because they're too fat to make the wieners. And uh, you can't schedule the product through because that's a kind of a cut that comes out of the, the ribs and the lines that go into the states and you've got to fabricate those. So th then you start to figure out what you're going to do with those. And uh, in her, but then you've got four or five in there that don't match anything. And, and so if you don't have a breaking operation, something else to do with those, heaven help you what you do with those because nobody wants them. And the hacker, the partner, you know, sends in a bunch of cows and he gets one that's graded with a hard bone or something else and all that, and he figures he's really been had. But he, if he got out of his problem easy, he got rid of it. We don't know what the hell to do with it. That's what you generally end up doing if you don't watch is that it hangs there for about two weeks and you finally decide you have nothing else to do with it, so some guy takes it over the corner and bombs it out. And you, then you tell your partner, don't buy any more of those. But that, that's kind of the kinds of problems that you get into. Uh, and I think the only reason I'm really telling this story is that there's a lot of money that's wasted in the system that we ought to be able to divide up between us by scheduling things in some sensible manner. Uh, if, uh, if we could get some stability into the system, then uh, a lot of the, there uh, would be a lot more money that is currently being wasted that could be divided up. And so there, there, is, there, there are some distinct benefits from having a system in which you, you know what's going to happen and it happened. <coughs> if, if, I, if I knew that my clients would get an adequate kill on Monday morning if I make here in Calvin Hawks on Friday to Monday, you can believe I wouldn't take that 2% shrink and all that feed bill I'm going to carry from Friday to Monday with. And certainly you have no objection, you know, to, to pay them whatever the, the difference in getting the cattle versus what you what they're going to cost you anyway. As long as, as long as your total cost isn't any higher, why should you bother, you know, to with it? I think too that there's a, a a misconception quite often about buying cattle cheap or buying hogs cheap and uh, packers really don't do that as much as you might think they do. And all that happens and you, you get some sharky buyers and there's a guy told me from once in the old saying from the Los Angeles police, you know, as long as you recruit from the human race, you won't get some crooks. But uh, the, the thing is that you, you really are, are much more stringent, we're much, much more educated about buyers that, that buys cattle too cheap intentionally than, than we are about any other single thing. Because we know, and you know, if you've got a guy that will steal for you, he'll steal from you. And uh, you, if you think that you're going to come get a bunch of crooks working for you and, and they're going to help you, uh, you're wrong. They're going to help themselves in the end. And anyway, uh, uh, the, we've got to buy cattle 365 days a year type of thing, and you cannot afford to live with the reputation of having some buyers that are trying to skin producers. It just doesn't work. It, uh, they, the short-run advantage is not nearly worth the long-range disaster that occurs that way. So if somebody 
it really turns you to a major company, you know, trying to steal cattle they're wrong. Now, let me say to you there, you know, as Mr. Staley said the other night, uh, we really don't care what we pay for the cattle in terms of the actual price of us. It doesn't make any difference to us. Uh, what we don't want to do, we can't afford to do, is pay more than, than uh, my friend Wilson down in the next room is paying. And uh, we often can pay less for certain types of cattle than they can. Because we've got certain novels, like that sounds like they want to reach out to cows, they don't really get to use one this week. And so I don't want to buy them. And from a public relations viewpoint, you don't tell anybody, we don't want what you got. Because the next time he's going to have something to do with it. And whether rightly or wrongly, you have a tendency to, to, price it, to price him out of the frame of mind itself, so you do tell him to take it someplace else. I think it's probably wrong, but I think this is what really happens. In any event, we've got to look at what it's worth to us and, we, and what it's going to take to cost us to process it and how we're going to handle it. And then we're going to back that up into a bit. That's what we're going to, what we're going to try to buy the cattle for. And we'll adjust that as much as we have to based on what's going to what a competitor can run with the same type of cattle. But, but each, each company's got a different framework and a different outlet for the cattle. If you're basically just killing cattle, killing fed cattle, if, if you're going to get six to sevens, you can sell them, you're going to sell them to chain stores. The seven to eights are going to go to the breaking points. The eight to nines, heaven knows what you're going to do with them, you know, really. And uh, farm and the industry, persists on feeding cattle that will get to eight to nine hundred pound carcasses, I don't know. I do know this, I know that uh, anybody that did it didn't do a very good job of figuring what that last two hundred pounds cost them. Because I've, I've known some instances where a guy has fed cattle for an extra sixty days, got an extra six to eight cents a pound on what he was bid and lost money. This, uh, I thought I had a point I was going to make, but I forgot what it was. It must not have been very important. I think that the, the adjustments are very difficult. One of the questions that was raised this morning was relative to grade standards, which has been a, 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 a niggle, I think, to both packers and producers alike. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of motives claim as to why these things happen. I think anymore when regulations occur, they aren't, uh, they aren't planned, they just happen. Some guy might sit down and he writes a perfectly good bill that's equitable and fair and he starts through the, starts through the legislative process with it. But every group of any size and every importance has got a lobbyist there in Washington and a lot of other places that are trying to bend it to favor a particular group. And by the time you get through with most legislation, it's a little bit like the old saying is that a camera is where a committee tried to build a horse. And this is what I think happens in, in legislation. I don't think anybody, that anybody gets exactly what they wanted. I think that's what happened with great standards. We have a, a lot of fun in, in uh, some of the game strategy and location. I want to finish it up trying to buy cattle and hogs that are the cheapest to us with our particular outlets, which is why I said, forgot I was trying to make there a minute ago. And that is, a, uh, while you're not trying really to get your average price level down, you are trying very hard to concentrate on those particular ones that you have the particular outlets for. In my particular case, as I was telling you, I have a, a, a demand for cow meat. We probably have the second or third largest cow meat user in the United States. Consequently, I've got a very high demand for canner and cutter type cows, and practically none for the others. And uh, we have our pork pit fight in Storm Lake that essentially kills nothing in the South. We'll kill some butchers, but for personal life, we'll probably kill in that one plant. We'll probably kill 10% of the South that killed in the United States. And we have, we have the particular outlets for that uh, type of meat that we've developed over the years. Consequently, we probably will pay a better price. Or can pay, I can pay a better price for sales than anybody in the country can. The conversion I probably can pay is the price is, is some of my competitors can for, for the lighter hogs. <coughs> they force me to do it. Don't misunderstand me, but uh, 
in terms of my outlook, I can't so I'm going to concentrate here right now. Another thing I think that you want that I didn't get that I should have done when I was talking about this distribution thing. Um, everybody, of course, wants to say that they got the top of the market. When he's talking about sometimes a member's not going to get the best of it, just remember that in that situation when I was caught short of accounts, my immediate reaction is going to be to, uh, to Ernie Meyer. I say, well, do you know anybody's got any cows? And he's going to say, yeah, Joe Blunt down there's got some, but he wants three cents over the market for them. And uh, you say, that's all you've got. He said, well, you've got to have them this morning, go out and buy them. And then, uh, then your guy sends in some cattle someplace, and he goes back in the, and he talks to that guy, and he finds that guy next door about $3 more than he did. And it was your, you know, and you caused in the first place if you didn't ship the cattle that you're supposed to ship. But uh, it's going to happen to you if, uh, if uh, the stuff is scheduled in some manner, it doesn't arrive, sooner or later you're going to find somebody that got more than the market was, was worth because that's what cost them to do it. I don't know whether I'm making this point very well or not, but that's, uh, it, it's inevitably going to happen to you. Just let it, <coughs> and, and, and what one guy or two guys get uh, is, is not indicative of what a market is anyway. And, and secondly, uh, I've listened many times to members of organizations such as this one complain about the fact that they, they got more of their cattle alive than they got from on the rail. Now, this is highly probable. The only thing is, if he did, he probably he would have gotten more from alive than they were worth. And if he thinks he's going to do that consistently with any one packer, he thinks they're stupider than I think we are. Because, believe me, you may take us once, but you're not likely to do it consistently. We know just, we, we've got in our computers every lot of cattle that we ever bought and what they graded when we thought they were going to grade when we bought them. And I grew up in Kentucky where they raised you on parables. My old man says, if somebody takes advantage of you once, it's his fault. The second time, it's yours. So anyway, in any event, to better to take too much of your time, it might be better just to break off and see what kind of questions you want and, uh, to answer and ask them to me and I'll answer them the most, as honest and as fair as I can. <coughs> Good, tell me. Well, would it be on account of the import? Uh, no, uh, the, I don't think so. I think, let me see if I can tell you what I think. And I, I've been in business for a long time off and on, and there were two things that always made me mad. The first one was that I think it's because, but I, I don't want anybody to tell me what he thinks, I want to know what he has. And the second one is that we've never done it this way, which is not applicable right here. So I'm going to make, I'm going to commit the first sentence. I'm going to tell you what I think has happened. There, there is a tremendous difference in the value of cows. Uh, if, if I'm, if I'm going to get, a, you know, a 10, 50, 11, 50, or, or a 500 pound or 450 pound Holstein carcass out of the Midwest, I'm going to steal out of that carcass the rounds the loins, the insides, the outsides, the knuckles, shoulder quads, and I'm still going to come up with chunk meat, big enough chunks, that I can sell it as 90% in Bonus County. Now, if you go down in the southwest and get some of those feather jumpers, they'll, they'll throw a 3, 20, 3, 30 pound carcass. There's no chunks there big enough, of course, that you can steal them do anything with it. And, and still have anything left, so you end up with, basically, you're going to end up with a 75, 85 beef trim, and if you take anything out of it, and the, and the difference in the market is very dramatic. Now, when you get, because of the, of the structure of the industry, at least the last, last time I was checking this out, you'll find that much of the prefabricating steak business, the ponderosa, the nanza type steak, which is a cow for boning and breaking you to look at, it probably about 10 dollars. Most of those units are located on the West Coast. And you find yourself breaking cattle in the Midwest or even in the, in the, in the Northeast and shipping the loins and the ribs to the West Coast to go to the, the, the steakhouses. 
doesn't make particularly make sense from the economic viewpoint. It just happens to be what's known. You find a, a very large geographical difference in cow prices, I think, just, just due to the transportation and the strength. Uh, I've seen times when, uh, in, in the not too distant future, when we were making very large profits, going in cows in Chicago, Washington, and losing a shirt in uh, Dallas, Texas. And uh, obviously, you can't afford to fly cows in uh, northern Oregon and ship them to Dallas. So, so, and uh, a lot of them, you don't, a lot of, a lot of places you don't have a marketing system designed to move the cattle, particularly cattle from a local area, which is uh, one, of, one of the problems I think associated with agriculture has been the fact that you've got so many small independent producers that only, only know a local market. And over the years, we have had a proliferation of people that made a living of what, we, what I used to call as a kid, ten of course, I don't know what you call them anymore, but people that really lived on the fringes of buying stuff from farmers in small lots for a lot less than they were worth, accumulate them and sell them in larger lots or keep them for the market to go up and play the game. But a lot of them made a living doing this, and it, and, and it has to be something wrong with the system that permits this type of thing to happen. Look at a steer, a cow tail, it's no great. Uh, so every company that I know of, and I know most of them in this country, in the meat business, has got very exacting evaluation procedures for every buyer. He has to estimate the weight and grade of every animal he buys. And what they actually grade out is right back up against them. If he gets more than one or two percent out of kilter, they got him in the patch and find literally what he grows. And remember that most of this cattle we buy, we buy standard. And I have to believe that, uh, that our buyers look at more cattle than your feeder, and you probably can do a better job of telling what they're going to raise than you can from just looking at them. And you, but you fed them, and you know what you started with and what you got in them, and, and so you've got a big advantage. You know what they're going to raise from that viewpoint. It probably just about averages out. Most of, the, most of the people that I know that feed cattle got a pretty good idea about what they got with, under the scheme. Yes and no. I, I think if you run it down, it's probably six or seven percent of the cattle in this country are owned by pasture feeders, which is a fairly substantial number in terms of total. The, uh, it, it, I spent most of my last 15 years running a consulting company for the big bankers and farmers. And uh, if, if you really look at a packing plant just from the viewpoint of optimum operation, that a, a packing plant needs to feed about 20% of their own cattle. Uh, in terms of, I'm talking about just making the most money that that plant can make. That's about the optimum number for them to be. And uh, basically what it lets you do, it lets you even out the supply when you have storm markets or uh, it happens to be one of those days that the holidays are coming or the market, or the no, no cattle just happen to show up on the terminal for this reason or that reason today. 
you know, type of thing. And you basically know, at least those of us who work with prices and supplies and quantities every day, I can almost tell you that if the market's a dollar higher on hogs like yesterday than it was the day before, it, wasn't, it isn't for real, you know. And uh, it's not going to last. And so uh, most, most packers have got cattle on feed are not going to fall a market like that. You know, they'll throw some of their own. And conversely, if you get too many, and they've been killing some of their own, they'll take them off the market and, and drop their own kill out because they know they shouldn't have been that cheap today. Occasionally you'll get bust, however, and you can miss this thing, but basically you won't. I, I think that most panthers would rather not feed cattle. Uh, if you have some regularity of supply, they knew they were going to get them. I don't think they touch them with a 10 foot pole. Because they don't feed cattle in that money, they cause you innumerable problems uh, in, in cattle feeding because if we're not in this particular part of the operation, our cattle operations are not that big. But if, if, if I'm going to need cattle and, and you're going to need them you know, five days a week, 32 weeks a year, and, I, and the, market, the futures market gets up where I can sell the cattle, buy the feeders, buy the feed, and make one dollar every head. I just put cattle in the people. Now there's no way under God's green earth that you can do it. But uh, th this is, is, is done primarily to get the cattle to kill you. You don't want to lose any money feeding cattle, obviously, but they're, they're not going to turn to the profit model. You add to that tax angle of uh, charging this year's feed bill and this next year's cattle to the doctors and the lawyers, you've got a great deal of problems in the cattle feeding industry that you've had to live with. And uh, I'm not going to you know, make any blinded judgments as to what's right or wrong. This is the system under which we operate. Certainly, if you, if you get enough, get the supply stable. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things I didn't say, we've got a system in this country now where the supply that goes to the retail, through the retail stores is relatively stable. And that's caused most of our problems. The retailers don't like to change prices. They fight it very hard because the house life doesn't like to have varying prices when she goes into the store. You know, steak's $2 this week and a dollar and a half next week, and they want to know why they were $2 last week. And then they go back the next week, they're $2 again, they wonder why we went up. And the store managers tell me, and I think correctly, that uh, this is more hassle than it's worth, and, and so they don't want to change prices. They don't change them that much. But what happens is, if you've got, a, if you've got, all, you've got a certain supply of cattle that's moving through, and the prices are fixed right at the retail counter to move that many, you get just four or five loads more than that around that got to move, and there's no place for them to go. And the wholesale market, the breakfast market, the line market just falls out there. Because nobody needs them. You don't have you don't wait for it. Why should you get them? And just on the other side of the thing, if you get just a few too many, the price is not going to go up five or six cents a pound on the carcasses and then the live cattle. Nothing happens to retail, you don't change the distribution. And so what we've got is we've, we've got a system that is getting progressively worse on price fluctuations. And you, and, you, and you better believe that five years from now, we're going to do something about it, it's going to be a lot worse than it is now. You can put Ten cents a pound offer on live cattle right now from a bottom to a high and never change a thing in the whole system. Because it, if it's priced by the retailer is making a margin of about five or six cents above normal as he has been making for about six months now. You put that nickel on and you won't do anything, you get back to normal profits. He's afraid his competitor won't raise his prices, so you can put another nickel on before he gets to lose enough money to do something about it. So you can put a $10 swing on live cattle and not do a thing like the cow stuff. And the thing that will happen, the thing that will happen, the thing that will really happen is if the market starts going up, the gathering can raise his prices. But he put, the first thing he cuts is his specials, which is his effect raising prices. He quits promoting that up. And, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the answer to that is somewhere in between the SAGL and 
there's some things that know they have them, and they get on. In terms of the quality of the meat, no. In terms of what you can do with it, yes. Uh, no. You've got a got McGregor in there, and uh, uh, he's doing very hard every season. And it may be like the guy in the next plant, it may not be. But at least I think in their government employees and they get supervised, they probably do a reasonably good job. Uh, but uh, no, it's interesting that the, the post bill plants are an awful lot better than all the choice. They don't have any place to go to the deer. No, uh, that, that's the, the reason, but it's not because that plant is that, that's the quarter plant across the whole country. Same thing is true with, uh, I mean, if you look at the, at the market sheet, uh, they, they paid you exactly what, what you would have gotten in any other plant in the country.
What's your question? Is the cat different? Um, yes, uh, I think it's a little different color. That's not really a problem. It's kind of to do with the conformation and cutting out and what you, you know, what you can do with meat after you actually get it. So we, we, the, the system, to some extent, circumvents the grade standards. The grade standards uh, have, have done, I think, the industry a great disservice to the most people who disagree with me because it has prevented any marketing organization from getting printed out their cost. Because the government came along and printed it and said, this is choice, this is good. And all of a sudden, the choice market on a steer is almost identical to what they found good is worth 10 cents a pound more or 8 cents a pound more or 6 cents a pound more. And the reason is because if I'm going to sell it to a cheap store and he advertised for almost 10 years, I sell them the choice kill. You're not going to move a good to there. Didn't want you hung.
was happier than you were. Thank you. 
fel egy másik nap, de én nem kívánok aztán a vacsorában nászok. Ne volt az egyik mai gáz, nem az egyik. Mert nem volt az egyik mai gáz, nem az egyik. Mert nem volt az egyik mai gáz, nem az egyik. Any further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Haverkamp. Thank you very much, Al. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, did we have those, did we find that it helped any if these li lights in front were off? Um, because uh, we, I'm going to rely rather heavily while Cecil is going to maybe turn off one bank here uh, on some slides, which will provide some basic trends in the hog and pork business as we see it from a pork processing vantage point from where I sit. You know, after all, both processors and processors, pro producers and processors have millions of dollars invested in this business, and we uh, have ample opportunity and reason to work closely together, joint action programs to develop a more healthy, growing, and, pros and profitable industry. I know those th that phrase probably is sort of a cliche, but when it is crucial, uh, and it's that cruciality, as I see it, starts with the consumer, and that's the reason why these slides start with the consumer, because uh, as I view it from beginning to end, uh, she is so terribly critical uh, to our welfare without her willingness to buy pork products. Think about this for just a moment. Without her willingness to buy them, there would simply be no pork industry. And we just can never forget it. And one of our jobs, as we see it as a processor, is try to develop new and better products and improve them so that we are uh, uh, helping that consumer to uh, put more money on the line because the more she is willing to spend, basically, for pork, why the more money is going to be available for all segments right down to the line, including the producer. Uh, shall we try that one? There we are. In this first slide, consumer expenditures. Think of it as the amount that the consumer spends per person, per each of these years that are shown here. And in the interest of looking at pork, for instance, uh, in 1975, that's 68 dollars per person. And the important thing about it in comparing this number with the other kinds of meat and food shown here, uh, it represents a percentage increase from 1970 to 75. When you say to me, what's happened over the past five years, I would be underscoring that figure there of 42%. Now, going across on that same bottom line, You'll notice with me that that 42 is not quite as large an increase as we had in the case of beef and chicken. And that disturbs me just a little, not a big difference there, but it bothers me quite a bit that when I look over at all food, 57% increase. And I think, by golly, with a great product such as we have in, uh, in the form of pork, and uh, I th when I think of all foods in the store, I think that pork ought to be showing as fully as much of an increase over time, growing as rapidly as all food. But that has not been the case. And so this is, uh, I'm going to spend now, uh, go through a couple of slides, giving you some illustrations of how we think that demand can be stimulated and improved further. And this is an example taken from the ham. This is industry, federally inspected smoked ham production. And it shows that uh, that old type, old fashioned bone in uh, regular ham, production of it has, uh, as of 1974, you see, was 865 million pounds. 
These are all in millions of pounds. It was 539 for the first 43 weeks of this year. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that when I take this data on boneless ham production, you know, put up in a nice, ready-to-eat, convenient, attractive package, uh, we then see over in this extreme column, extreme right column, that over the past three years, that percentage has gone up from 29% to 40 percent. In other words, it's an illustration of how when you can improve the product, consumers are going to put out more money for it. Oh, the what causes something like this? Changes in lifestyle have things to do with it. Uh, uh, I'm sure that the fact that today we have, uh, well, such things as 44 percent of the married women in this country are in the labor force. Ten years ago, that was only 30 percent. Well, this cannot help but have bring about certain changes in lifestyle, in habit, in meal preparation and the like. And so we are looking for things that fit in with that trend. Let's take a look at another example. Away from home eating. When you go down and spend money at McDonald's or at KFC, why that money, in effect, the way the government puts it together, you see, is going to put it in this away from home category. You're spending dollars away from home. Uh, it, whereas if you go in the grocery store, why well, that becomes food for use at home. The important thing there, do you see the trend over in the right-hand corner, uh, right-hand side rather? Well, aw uh, away from home eating is becoming, is growing uh, rapidly and basically at the expense you see of retail store sales. So uh, this is significant to us because up until this point, the pork industry has not had a big share of the, what we call the HR&I business, the hotel, restaurant, and institutional business. Perhaps only maybe a little less than 10% of all of our pork uh, goes to this big market. And when you see this market growing rapidly, well, by golly, it's time to sit up and do something about it. And we're working on that. Sure, we're not going to throw uh, chicken out of KFC, but just a year ago we did uh, get a long way on a large-scale experiment whereby KFC was going to and did try to add pork spare ribs as an addition to their menu, and I still think that that is going uh, to be, that'll be a, a going thing someday. So these fast food chains do not stick to just one uh, item alone, and if we can't go in and uh, establish pork houses, okay, we'll go in and do the next best thing. Uh, this next chart gives one other example of uh, one other example of uh, uh, demand growth. Only in this case, it's not domestic; it's uh, export. In the case of export, again, the last three years, it looks as though we are going to basically double those exports. I know it's from a very low base, but nevertheless, it represents growth, and it's going to grow more. We have here 196 million pounds in 1974, move up to 415 million by 1976, and uh, much of that, interestingly enough, much of that growth is to one country. Uh, namely Japan. The Japanese will be consuming, will be purchasing this year about half of that 415 million, about 200 million pounds. And out of that 200 and 100 million pounds, uh, it's uh, kind of interesting that they concentrate their purchases primarily upon just two items, uh, pork butts and pork loins, and mainly butts. So uh, in total, ja the Japanese only about uh, buy about maybe two or three percent now of our pork supply, but they're buying about ten percent, ten percent of our pork butt supply. In other words, we produce in this country that one uh, that one cut about one billion pounds a year, and the Japanese are buying a hundred million or ten percent of them. And uh, so it's kind of fascinating how some of these uh, trade winds blow. One, uh, earlier, I remarked that uh, that uh, it was the all of the fat that was on the the hog back in the early 60s and 50s, for that matter, was causing us a lot of trouble in terms of consumer demand. We were turning 
consumers away in droves, you might say, uh, prior to 1965 because of the fatness that she had to contend with and that she was uh, developing an increasing dislike and discrimination against. And uh, this chart, though, is beautiful, and it's hard to believe that we could have made as much progress as we have made in taking uh, fat off the hog because this is expressed in terms of lard yield per live hundredweight. And reading off of the right-hand scale, you'll see that when we were back in 1960, this was, uh, oh, about 15 pounds per live hundredweight. Now that figure is down last year to no more than six pounds. That's really fantastic. When you think of a hog, that doesn't change very much, but it has changed. It's changed drastically. And uh, that leads us into what has also happened as far as the pork in that, uh, in that uh, hog is concerned. The lard isn't there. It's taken out. And that very, nat it very naturally follows that the pork cuts are getting bigger. And they have gotten bigger. And this, these happen to be Wilson records because you can't find any industry figures of this kind that anybody has published or wants to publish. But uh, according to our records, over this period of time, these cuts have gotten that much heavier, uh, all from the, sing the same weight of hog, 230-pound hog. Uh, that is a rather dramatic story to me also. Want to try the next one, Cecil? <coughs> When you have that kind of increase in size of cuts, you say to yourself, well, by golly, what is that doing to price? Because uh, the volume of product is shifting out of the lightweight, light, uh, weight, range, weight ranges and into the heavier ones. So if everything else was holding constant, holding still, so to speak, well, you would expect the d price differentials to widen there would be more of a discount on like 20 to 26 hams would sell at greater discounts under the 14 to 17s. Likewise with the loins, 17 to 20s would sell at bigger discounts. But it, interestingly enough, that has not happened, mainly because I think the processor has done a much better job in recent years in merchandising and in converting those heavyweight cuts into convenient size cuts of one kind or another so that the demand in effect for them has increased relative to the demand for the lighter cuts and that's the reason why the differentials have held quite as well as they have. They haven't given ground at all. And uh, if you translate that, if you say, okay, uh, does that come through to the live side? I would contend that it absolutely does. Here, when we compare a lightweight hog, 200 to 220, with one that weighs 240 to 270, in uh, today, or last year, rather, with 10 years earlier, why, it shows that the price spread has actually become a little narrower in 1975 as compared with 66. And uh, so that does prove uh, the point that it's holding even though we're getting a heavier hog. Shifting gears now to, to uh, the whole question of, sea, of uh, fluctuation that we have in this industry and supplies, how much do they vary? Well, there are two kinds of fluctuation that I think of. I think of one as seasonal and the other is cyclical. Here, this one shows seasonal variation in hog slaughter and the quickest way perhaps to I read this and whether we're making any progress, well, you can see from the chart itself that federal inspected hog slaughter uh, was, uh, well, let's take the table, was uh, we, back in the World War II days, <clears throat> we were killing an average of 94,000 head per, per day in the month of August, which was the low month of the year. By the high month of the year, which the peak month, December, we were killing 182,000. In other words, we back in those days, we were slaughtering twice as many hogs in the peak month as we were in the low month. And uh, that, among other things, uh, you, you would think uh, doesn't make everybody happy because uh, 
uh, it was hard to hold uh, the price and you couldn't hold it because you were asking consumers to uh, buy and absorb and consume so much, uh, much more pork just three months uh, after they had had a dearth in supply. But that shifted by 1959 going uh, down the getting much closer to today we then had a low point of 139 in July the peak was 205 and if you divide the 205 by the 139 why uh, you find out that then we had only a 47 47 percent increase so we were cutting down the amount of fluctuation Make a long story short, coming over here to 69 to 71, we have only a 16, uh, a 26% increase. And there, interestingly enough, we no longer have uh, a December peak in slaughter. But the, what is the high month in slaughter in 69 to 71? Well, it had shifted there to April, 241,000 head per day. And the low month, August, 190. You divide the 241 by 190, and that gives a 26% increase, which means then that when you compare here, 100% increase, 47% increase, 26% increase, and some of us think that if uh, we make, uh, if confinement operations continue to grow with uh, many more hog producers turning out and marketing about the same number of hogs every month, why this is going to uh, get a lot closer to uh, practical uh, zero change. This brings out a little bit of the cyclical side of it, whereby from year to year, numbers have varied a great deal, going from, oh, we can start here as a peak, 1970, we had 86 million head that were slaughtered that year, looking at the total, which is the calendar year total. We, for 1971, which was our all-time high, that's the record, of 94, and it was understandable then that we dropped off to 85, <clears throat> but they, a lot of other things came along, including price controls, a drought in 1974, and what have you. And uh, we have the very low point here in many, many years, in 1976, of only 68.7 million head. So th it has been awfully erratic and difficult for our entire industry, and uh, we badly need, as far as the Packers is concerned, and we're not the only one, we know more stability uh, from year to year, as well as seasonally. <clears throat> A word or two on industry structure. On this particular slide, we have two things, the packing plant sector and the retail store sector. Notice on the retail stores first, we'll start there. Back in 1939, this industry in the United States, there were 446,000 of them. That de declined, dropped, until by 1975, it was down to only 167,000. So we've gotten a lot fewer stores and a lot bigger stores and uh, folks that I know pretty well in the food industry suggest that they're going to get a lot bigger yet because uh, mainly I would say because they're going to be adding a lot more non-grocery store items. Uh, everything that uh, can routinely that one root needs for his routine needs will be available in the one store so they uh, are contending. And that's the reason why the newer stores are uh, absolutely huge. However, the meatpacking plants have gone exactly the other direction. Uh, perhaps it's due in part to the fact that livestock hogs, in this case, are produced in every state. And uh, you can't, obviously, it doesn't make sense to move them to, uh, long, long distances to where there is a big efficient plant if you're going to lose all of the efficiency in shipment. So that is one reason why we have uh, small plants, uh, even though they aren't as efficient as the big ones, located in some of the non Corn Belt states. In contrast here, if we look at what's happened on the farm, this is really dramatic as you look back, uh, if you're willing to go back to, well, 1949 is not all that long ago. And at that time, we had over 2 million farms in the United States selling hogs, 2 million. And by 1959, it had dropped 
I'm looking right here now, 1959, reading off that scale, it dropped to about a million three. 1969 brought us down to, as I remember, that's 565,000 head. It's now been dropping, you see, uh, in 74, we're going to be down to about 430. It's dropping at the rate of 30% every five years. It's been about the rate it's been dropping, about 6% per year. And with uh, confinement operations apparently picking up, accelerating somewhat at least during the last two or three years, there's every reason that one of the safest things you can bet on is that 1979 is going to have fewer numbers than what we had in 1974. Our best guess that we have plotted on there is 300,000 head, which, which uh, 300,000 farms, and that of course is still quite a sizable number of farms, but it's uh, sure a lot different than the two million that we had back here. Well, CISO, I, uh, Al isn't here at the moment. May I just say that uh, I have appreciated very much this opportunity to be here, and I certainly look forward to working with you and all of your good people uh, for many years in the future. Thank you. This 1976 convention of the NFO at Milwaukee is centered toward commodities and how the National Farmers Organization bargains in commodities. One of the principal features is that these sessions are inviting the best experts from all over the country. Uh, the grain people are talking to folks in the export-import business and people who represent buyers both in this country and abroad, and the livestock people are talking to their specialists. And this is, the interview I'm going to do now is with Leonard J. Haverkamp, who is Vice President and Economist for Wilson and Company. He was invited to address this session by the NFO Hog Division. Uh, welcome to the program, Mr. Haverkamp. Delighted to be here. What were they, what are you going to say to these people in our Hog Division? Well, I'm going to try and cover several basic trends in the hog and pork industry as we see them from our vantage point as a pork processor, Phil, and uh, in that way, uh, possibly bring some insights that aren't always quite so visible just on the farm scene alone. Um, so uh, I would like to start off with uh, the main thing I've given this group is uh, some insights into how important consumer demand is to us. We are not, we aren't in direct contact, of course, with the consumers like the retailer is, but we do happen to be one step closer than the farmer. and. Uh, what is, I think, consumer demand is terribly important because if you take the extreme, uh, if uh, consumers didn't like our product, why, uh, there wouldn't be a hog and pork industry. So That's how right. could it be more important than that? Well, as one of the big uh, pork processors in the whole world and uh, dealing with the NFO through various supply arrangements, would you say that the demand for pork is on the increase? It has been, since that it has been trending up slowly but surely since about the mid-60s. Uh, prior to that time, I might just touch on this, from about 1950 until the mid-60s, it was sliding downhill. In other words, as I measure it as an economist, I can would say that there was a, about a 25% decline in it up until about the mid-60s, and the most important single reason for that is that the uh, we were just producing a hog that was too fat. And producers, to their everlasting credit, uh, did rather rapidly change the type of hog. And we had pu started putting leaner pork on the market, and from that point forward, why, it made all the difference in the world. You were showing me some charts. One of them was indicating an increased preference on the part of consumers for certain types of, of uh, pork, certain types of a boneless ham, I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Would you tell me about that? Yes. Uh, this comes in the area of our efforts to continually upgrade uh, our products, making hams and all cuts, for that matter, more attractive to the consumer so that she is uh, willing to buy more of it make it more attractive. And one of the things that we have worked on, the industry has worked on a long time, was to take this ham, the old style, regular, skin on for that matter, bone-in ham, and make it so attractive, make it boneless, uh, subject it to special cure, and, uh, and 
and uh, have it uh, give it the maximum appeal so that it is convenient, easy to prepare, uh, ready to eat, and uh, this fits in beautifully with the kind of of uh, changes in lifestyle that we have today with many more uh, married women going into the labor force they don't have time to spend a lot of time in meal preparation like they used to now the point here is that as we follow these statistics very closely it's been just in the past three years that this particular trend has sh uh, shot up boneless hams today in 1976 will constitute just about 40% uh, of total smoked ham production, and just three years ago, that percentage was only 29. So that, to us, is a very gratifying rate of increase, you see, in yes, such I a short say time. Be. What are some of the other trends that, uh, that you've noticed uh, as a representative of one of the packers? What other trends are you noticing uh, on the part of uh, a packer? Well, as I look, think about opportunities for improving the demand for pork, Bill, uh, I, th I see a great big rapidly growing away from home market as far as food is concerned. Everybody is aware, is aware of uh, fast food uh, uh, eating places yes. and the HR and I trade, hotels, restaurants, and institutions. Well, that market is growing, and pork has, uh, has not had... Uh, a sizable share of it. As most of us know, beef has and chicken have had kind of uh, uh, cultured places there, and what I would say is that, as best we can estimate, pork really, only about 10% of the total pork supply has been going into that so-called away-from-home market. So one now, of your objectives is this, to get more pork? To, exactly, right. exactly. Don't blame you. Some uh, pretty good estimates have been made that in another 10 years, the typical American will be eating every other meal away from home, 50%, in other words. Now, that's we just can't uh, uh, ignore that market, you see. We've got to get work at getting pork in there in a more active uh, uh, fashion. If I begin we want to see to why your industry demand. needs economists. <laughs> well, you're very kind. <laughs> uh, now, okay, so I would think the farmer has a real stake in seeing that uh, a big uh, pork processor like Wilson and Company uh, could uh, move into that expanded area. You were showing me some figures that I know would bear very directly on the farmer's interest, and that is the times of the year when uh, the hogs are coming into the packing industry. Used to be that farmers complained about the being imprisoned to the fall hog rush. What about that? Is that picture improving? No, it's changed. It's been changing very rapidly, Phil. For a base benchmark, let's go back to. Uh, well, just before World War II, around the 1940s, would you believe that at that time uh, in December, December was the peak slaughter month, and we were, the industry was slaughtering just double, twice as many as it was slaughtering in the low month, which was August. So between August and December, we were asking consumers, you see, keeping consumers in mind, we were asking them to almost double their, uh, their pork consumption. Well, this is asking, uh, is creating quite a wrench, you see, on all segments of the industry when we, do not, when we have that degree of instability. Well, 10 years later, 1959 to 61, the high month of slaughter was still December, but, and the low month was July, but by that time, the, the peak month uh, was only 50% larger than the low month, or compared with earlier, I said, you see, it was 100% larger. Now, coming closer, by 1969, 70, and 71, the last three-year period here, why the, uh, uh, the peak month had switched, believe it or not, to the month of April. December was no longer the peak month. We had been shaving it down all the time. August is still the low month, but the difference to go from August to April, the high month, is not, was, not, was then only a 26% increase. So from a, a doubling, 100% increase 20 years ago, we're now down to only a 26% increase. And I, I contend that that's a lot of progress uh, in bringing yeah. about more seasonal stability. Yes, right. And this also uh, this gives an advantage to you folks in supplying the consumer 
or supplying the retailers and wholesalers, and that also, I should think, would bring a stability factor into the pricing of hogs for the hog producer out there. True, true. You might tie in one other factor from the farmer's standpoint, uh, and that uh, uh, that we see is with us, and it's really not so new, but uh, confinement operations, large, more specialized hog operations, are coming, appear to be coming in rather rapidly over the past three or four years. Yeah, and, with, and, and with re respect, just think for a moment, uh, that with respect to this uh, seasonal factor, I, I, I am pretty sure that those chaps are going to be marketing, uh, scheduling, you see, throughout their uh, confinement operations, they'll be on a system whereby they'll be marketing about the same number almost every month of the year. And I would s suggest that maybe if we go down in the road another 10 years, we're going to find that line awfully flat uh, as far as seasonality of slaughter. In other words, we might be slaughtering someday almost the same number every month if we, right. if we go, depending on how, how far we go on confinement operations and how fast. But uh, that seems reasonable to me, doesn't you? It certainly does. The reason I'm talking to Mr. Haverkamp on this interview is because he's an example of the first-line specialists who are appearing here to talk to these commodity people. And you can see that he's giving very useful, down-to-earth, nuts-and-bolts information to these people of the National Farmers Organization who are talking about commodity bargaining. Do you regard this as an opportunity for your firm to talk to producers? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, we're delighted to have this opportunity to uh, visit here with uh, at the uh, NFO annual convention. It's my first opportunity to visit here, and I have been frankly amazed at the tremendous crowd. When you talk like last night, we had uh, I attended uh, uh, Mr. Staley's talk, and uh, as I understand it, 8,000 people were in that building. I think that's just tremendous. I, very seldom have I. Uh, had an opportunity like that. Yes, I've worked for the NFO for years, and it never ceases to amaze me. The, uh, si well, part of the reason is that these delegations come direct from counties, and uh, it rivals in size the uh, national political convention. Sure does, sure does. Mm -hmm. I've been talking with Mr. Leonard Haverkamp, who is vice president and economist for Wilson & Company, one of the largest uh, packers and uh, one of the biggest pork producers, uh, processors in the whole world. He's appearing here as one of the guest specialists talking to these commodity sessions at the NFO National Convention for 1976 in Milwaukee. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.